Hey guys, welcome. Yeah, so I have something really exciting for you here. Um, and that is a proof of Euler's formula without using Taylor series. Remember Euler's formula? In some corners, it's touted as the most beautiful equation in mathematics, but I'd say hold your horses. It is pretty darn beautiful, but I don't know if I'd say it's the most beautiful equation in all of mathematics. Uh, it's not just beautiful, it's very useful. And this is what we're talking about. The fact that e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i times sine theta. Now, this will show up a lot in advanced mathematics. And I already have a video dedicated to proving this equation, but using Taylor series. Um, and so check out that video if you want to see how this is done using Taylor series. But in this video, we're going to do it without Taylor series. So it's equally cool, um, if not more cool. All right, cool. So, <laughs> all right. So, so why do we care about this equation? Well, among other things, one reason why this is perhaps touted as the most beautiful equation in math is because if theta is equal to pi, then what we'd have is e to the i pi on the left side, which we'd have to say is equal to, um, by the right-hand side here, cosine pi plus i times sine pi. But wait, we know that sine pi is zero, and we know that cosine pi is negative one. So keeping that in mind, we see that the equation reduces to this. And then adding one to both sides of this, we're going to be able to write this here. And this is quite neat. It's quite beautiful, actually, because all of the important numbers in math show up in this equation. E, a transcendental number roughly equal to 2.7, and then I, the imaginary unit, square root of negative 1, and then pi, uh, the uh, ratio of the circumference over the diameter in a circle, and then of course 1, the multiplicative identity, and 0, the additive identity, right? These are our favorite numbers in math, and they're all contained in this equation. So that alone is one reason to really appreciate this equation here. But why else would we care? Well, again, among other things, this is another reason we care about this equation. Because a complex number in polar form can be written as z equals r times cosine theta plus i times sine theta. And notice that we're saying that a complex number in polar form can be written as z equals r e to the i theta. So this here is involved in the definition of a complex number in polar form. And it turns out that once you express a complex number in polar form, that is in this manner, uh, raising it to a large power is pretty simple. It turns out that z to the power n is simply equal to r to the power n times cosine n theta plus i times sine n theta. That is, if you have a complex number in polar form represented as z equals r e to the i theta, it turns out that z to the n is simply r to the n e to the i n theta. So what this means is that like say taking a complex number and raising it to the hundredth power is quite simple. And so this is another reason why we really love this equation. Yeah, and this result by the way is called De Moivre's theorem and I have a video on it. Uh, and so check that out. De Moivre's theorem for uh, raising complex numbers to a large power makes it super simple. In rectangular form, if you want to raise a complex number to the hundredth power, you have to foil and simplify, and you have to foil a hundred times. Why would you want to do that? So you see this result is super powerful, this here, which subsequently leads to this, again, De Marv's theorem. Yeah? Okay, cool, cool, cool. But let's stay focused. Remember, um, from the onset, what we wanted to accomplish in this video is proving this without Taylor series. So let's get at that. Here it goes. So the proof starts this way. First, let's define f of theta as being e to the minus i theta times cosine theta plus i times sine theta. So f of theta we define in this manner. Notice that f of theta is a product of two functions. Functions of theta, that is this here, times that. So I'm saying if we want to, we can see f of theta as g of theta times h of theta, where clearly g of theta is equal to e to the minus i theta, and h of theta is this fella, right? Okay, cool. Now, we know by the product rule for derivatives that 
f prime of theta is going to have to equal g prime of theta times h of theta plus g of theta times h prime of theta. We're all very familiar with this product rule for derivatives, so there's nothing fancy that I did here. Okay, cool. Keep in mind, g of theta is this and h of theta is this. And so we see that f prime of theta in this specific case, the way we define f, is going to have to be this here. I didn't do anything fancy here. Uh, remember, i and therefore negative i is just a constant. So i and negative i are constants. And so uh, when we're taking the derivative of g of theta, that's all we have to keep in mind. Keep in mind that negative i is a constant. Otherwise, we know that e to the minus i theta will have derivative negative i e to the minus i theta, right? And so this is g prime, and then this is h plus g, and this is clearly um, h prime. And so I just executed the product rule in this part. That's all I did. Uh, and so I'm not going to um, comment more. Now, in the next step, what we could do is notice that e to the minus i theta appears here and here. So we can factor it out. Doing precisely that, we can write this. That is, we can write that f prime of theta is actually equal to this. Now, notice that we had to retain the minus i theta that was there, right here, multiplying this part, right? Otherwise, uh, this is gone, and so we don't have it over here, and it's gone from uh, this first part, and it's all the way in front, right? Factor it out. Okay, cool. Now, let's distribute this minus i in this first parenthesis, simplify, and see what we get. It's really neat. So first, as I said, distribute this minus i to this part and to this part as we should. And so we get this and this. And remember, i squared is negative 1. So in this part, we have minus negative 1, which is plus 1. So this is all going to be plus sine theta, right? And so taking care of that, we see that we can write this is our next step of f prime of theta. Okay, cool. Now, sine theta minus sine theta is 0 in this part. And this first guy is also going to add to this guy so that they add to zero. Yeah? So this whole thing in the square brackets um, is equal to zero. So what we have is f prime of theta is equal to e to the minus i theta times zero. Right? Let me show that. So right here. Cool. So that clearly means that f prime of theta is equal to zero. Right? But wait, if f prime of theta is equal to 0, that means that f of theta is equal to a constant for all theta. Regardless of what theta is, f of theta has to equal a constant because f prime of theta is equal to 0, right? Okay, cool. But wait, we said that f of theta is this. So what we're saying is this here is equal to a constant k for all thetas, right? Okay, cool. Uh, there, let's spell it out. That's what we just said, right, in conclusion. All right, all right, all right, where to from here? Well, we need some space, and I'll show you. This is pretty exciting. So here we are. We just said that f of theta is equal to a constant for all theta, and so if we pick theta to be 0, we can solve for the constant k, and uh, we can solve very easily, in fact. So if theta is equal to 0, we have that um, this has to be true. Now, we know cosine of 0 is 1, and we know sine of 0 is 0. So in this part, we're going to get 0. This is going to turn into 1, and we just have e to the 0, right? That's all we have in this part. So we have 1 right here, and then we have 1, and then 0 here. But wait, that all simplifies to say that k is equal to 1. Ah, cool. So uh, coming back to this step, what we've got is that this here is equal to 1 because we just learned that k is equal to 1. Remember, this had to hold true for all theta. It was independent of theta. So we could have picked any theta value to solve for k. And of course, we picked 0 because it was super convenient, right? All right, all right, all right. So what I just said is now we can write that this means this, right? Because we just figured out what k is. All right, cool. But then once here, upon dividing by e to the minus i theta on both sides or by multiplying by e to the positive i theta. Listen to what I just said. Either multiplying both sides of this by e to the positive i theta or dividing both sides of this by e to the minus i theta, we get the desired result. Isn't that cool? Yeah, I thought so. Um, all right. Have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed this. Keep watching. Take care.